there's a long list of things that any leader has to get right. Mm. Whether it's for profit or non-profit, doesn't matter. If it's for profit, you've got to have a really good product. It's got to mm -hmm. be well developed. It's got to be tested. It's right. got to meet a real need. Yeah. You need really good marketing to understand your market, know who the customers are, know where they are. You have to have a really good offer and you have to have good pricing and you have to be able to get your messaging out to those customers. You got to have good technology. You got to be able to build. Wow. As somebody at Bell Southwood, the leader of our Bell South organization used to say, if you can't build it, it's just a hobby. <laughs> And that's true. You have to have really good operations because you have to deliver. You have to have salespeople who can really find a customer's need and mm -hmm. really develop that prospect and sell. You need good customer service. And you need, all of those things are important. You need good finance. You've got to get the right capital in the right places. Mm -hmm. But all of those hard aspects of running an organization are fueled by people. <laughs>
uh, through coaching and you know eventually performance management and HR gets involved at some point and then you, know, you, you have a formal process. Right, right. And so I started trying to, to use that technique. I was every day mm-hmm. looking for gaps in performance. I was really too aggressive early in, and that's mm. probably not uncommon, but I was looking for gaps and I would go sit down with the employees and start talking about it. And then I was going to workshops and reading books to try to get better and better at it. But at some point it dawned on me, I was sitting across from a gentleman whose name I will not call, but it occurred to me, he has the skill to mm-hmm. do what gap I'm seeing. Mm. And I've seen that he can do it and he has the will, he mm-hmm. wants to do it. So the formula that I had been taught, will or skill wasn't mm-hmm. working. And then over a course of some conversations, it dawned on me, he did not have the confidence to mm-hmm. do it. He did not see that he could do it. I saw it, mm-hmm. but he did not see what I saw. And then I've seen that multiple times mm-hmm. over and over in my career. And it really led me to start figuring out what can I do to help an employee overcome that lack of confidence. Mm-hmm. And I've been on, this has been a 20 year journey for me to try to figure out and learn. And now I want to help others do it. Right. No, I love it. Well, and, and, and you know, as you, as you say, through your material um, is that, and, and I love the way you phrase this, that you are enough, unique, beautiful, and capable. You can do it, improve, succeed. You will take control, take the next step, captain your own ship. I mean, that's so yeah. empowering. Um, di- how did you come up with, with those phrases? I mean, what was the, uh, you know, the, kind of the philosophy mm-hmm. behind that? I've been working on this for a couple of decades, but I didn't have in mind that I would ever do this for somebody else. That wasn't why. Mm -hmm. And so in the last couple of years, as this opportunity has presented itself, I've used that an opportunity to reflect what have I learned. I've tried to do other research and talk to other people and let me put together something that Mm -hmm. I could use as a workshop. Or if I was, if I was consulting, how could I help guide somebody else through it? You need some kind of, uh, you need, you need it codified in some way. And so, at some point I realized, well, it needs to be a little bit catchy. It needs to have some kind of rhythm to it. And that's where those words came yeah. from. It's just really an attempt to organize what I've learned through the years. Mm. No, I, I really, and, and I think that's so powerful. I mean, as you were, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, especially as a leader, and I'm sure you've heard this kind of fake it till you make it, right. you know, and it's, um, you know, those, are, we, we don't realize that whether you're leading people or you're just trying to manage yourself, that, You've got what you need. You you may need a little help, but right. but you're enough, right? You, you don't have to kind of put on this facade right. or this mask. Um, you know, and even like how you say in your material, uh, a lot of managers kind of go with that drill sergeant mm-hmm. type yeah. uh, mentality. The, the marine approach of let's tear them down so we can rebuild them yeah. and refashion them in our own way, right? Right, right. And and that may work in the military. Right. Um, but it not in a business, not, not in a nonprofit, no, not in a school. No, you know. it does, doesn't I, work. It seems to me, at least what I have observed, is that oftentimes someone's self-confidence is rooted in a relationship that doesn't even exist in the workplace. Hmm. It could be with their father or their mother or, or their little league coach where some seed was planted that, that they weren't enough. And it probably wasn't even intended these are people you know parents certainly want the very best right. for their children and coaches want the best performance and oftentimes in the zeal to help bring out the best mm-hmm. the technique for doing that actually has the opposite effect it's destructive instead of constructive mm. and they might say something and those words might linger on in that child's mind through youth and then adulthood and they take it to the workplace and as a leader we can't fix what happened 20 or 30 years ago <laughs> on a ball field. That's right. That's or, right. Or at home at the dinner table. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think any of us would believe that you can fix that. But what you can do, I can't change what somebody else has done. And I can't even change you, mm. but I can change me and how I interact with you. And we can start with today. And if we can get you on a better path mm-hmm. and as a leader, why do you care? Well, I've got results to deliver. That's right. Results is really the primary measure of any organization, Mm -hmm. whether it's for profit or not. Mm -hmm. And if you are not doing your best every day, then you're getting in the way of the organization not doing its best every day. Mm -hmm. So it's in my interest as a leader to tap into everyone's human potential, Mm -hmm. because when everybody is living up to their potential and growing, the organization will live up to its potential Mm -hmm. and grow. No, that's so impactful. And, And you're right. I mean, I like what you said about, you know, as a leader, what do you care? Right. Because 
I'm sure there are uh, some leaders out there that just want the results mm. delivered. Um, but as you were saying, it's oftentimes not enough just to say, do this or else. You can do that, and that is probably the most common mm -hmm. management tactic. Right. And what you will get is, especially if, if you're in a for-profit corporation where I hold your paycheck, right. it's amazing how, what you can convince someone to do mm. or to fake yeah, doing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to do, maybe not genuinely, but to do <laughs> yeah. if you hold their paycheck right. uh, in front of them. But are you getting someone's best? Mm. You're getting their compliance. And maybe that's all you want. Mm -hmm. But most leaders that I know, they want more than somebody just to show up, punch a clock, and do the bare minimum. Right. You want them to do far more than that's that. That's right. Yeah, you do. And, and that, you know, it was interesting. I, I had heard a, heard a slogan or a story. I don't know if it was in a book or something. You may, you may recognize it. But it was like, you know, I've got these employees. And from 9 to 5, they're just kind of like barely awake. And then as soon as the bell rings, they're all racing to the car and they're all excited to leave. And it's like, you know, why can't I get that enjoyment in the nine to exactly. five? But but it's to your point. I mean, if they're not inspired. I love these memes on Facebook and Instagram about, oh, this is the Mondayest Monday ever. Yeah. And, oh, it's a hump day. Yeah. It's only one more day of, uh, of the hostage situation. Yeah. Those are those are hilarious. But, you know, they're getting to I think what you're pointing out is is there's this belief that work is work and home is home and school is school and church mm -hmm. is church and community. and uh, That's not true. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard over and over again people say, well, we're doing something at, at work. We're making this big change. It's going to have an impact on you personally. It may even have an impact on your paycheck or your benefits or your future career possibilities, but it's not personal. Right. Yeah. Everything is personal. Yeah, if it not. affects my ability to bring home paycheck or have health care for my children if mm -hmm. they're sick, that's Everything right. is personal. Yeah. And I think really great leaders recognize that what they do at work has an impact on that employee at home. Mm -hmm. And what's going on at home has an impact on what that employee does at work. Mm. And if and you and you can as a leader change. I mean, you, you have no right to try to change something that's going on at someone's home. Mm -hmm. But you need to be aware that we're all one person mm. and everything that happens to us in any of the environments where we work mm -hmm. or lead or whatever we may do, has an impact on who we are in every environment where we show up. And if you will make right investments as a leader in the workplace, you will help make that better for them in those other places. And I believe it will come back to you in a mm -hmm. positive way. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I agree 100%. I think that, um, uh, and, and also, I mean, I agree exactly what you're saying, but I also think that, that folks are, they're looking for that. I mean, they, not, they may not come to work and say, hey, mm -hmm. I'm looking for somebody to hold me accountable, somebody mm -hmm. to make me a better person, right. somebody to make me a better father, somebody to make me a better husband. I mean, folks don't typically mm -hmm. say that, but that's what we're all really looking for, right? I mean, to a degree. It, it is, and I think many times we're looking for it and don't even realize we're looking for it. Yeah, yeah. I had an amazing experience last year. After I had retired, I had a couple of former employees reach out to me uh, wanting to um, – meet and, and and it was very refreshing and I really appreciated it but one in particular said something that shocked me it humbled me at the same mm -hmm. time uh, we went through a really bad work situation mm -hmm. together and I had to do some difficult things and say some difficult things mm -hmm. and no one I, I, maybe not maybe it's not true that no one I think most people do not like to create conflict or challenge someone that's or right. hold them accountable that's right and I do not. Mm -hmm. But I know, as a leader, uh, I've learned through through time that if I don't deal with a conflict, mm -hmm. it's like a cancer. It's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get to a healthy situation is to work through the conflict. That's right. And so with this particular employee, we worked through it. And it was painful for a while. And it took maybe, maybe months. I mean, I can't remember exactly. It's, it's been some time ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe three or four months. And what... I think could have ended up being a situation where someone left or was separated from the company. Mm -hmm. They didn't. And in fact, they became kind of a superstar in that department oh, long wow. after I had left. Yeah. And she wanted to tell me that she appreciated how I handled it and that I had forced her to look in the mirror until she saw herself as others did. Mm. And that not only changed her career, but she was explaining it changed her outside of her career. Wow. And I, I I'd never really thought about and we all have impact on people mm -hmm. and don't realize 
all the ripples mm -hmm. that that impact has beyond the, just the single interaction between us and them. Right. No, you're 100 percent right. And I think I think if we certainly as leaders, but but you're right, everybody does. And if uh, if we all kind of take that a little more seriously and figure out how to make how to help other people have better lives, right. uh, I, I think we can have more of those ripple effects right. rather than uh you know, it's, I mean, it's a natural tendency for us all to be very um, self-serving. I mean, that's just, it's natural. It's true. But we have to, human nature. we have to kind of step outside of right. that. We have to grow outside of that paradigm so that we can um, help other people, right. you know, get what they want. So Simon Sinek has a book. It's, uh, I don't know, five or six years old at this mm -hmm. point. Um, it's amazing. It's called Leaders Eat Last. Mm. And there are so many amazing learnings in that, but but it talks about leaders as as being servants, mm. uh, and I think that the typical construct we have is the leaders at the top and everybody else is at the bottom. But at the end of the day, if leader wants to get the result that they need, mm -hmm. they need the human potential. That's right. Exposed and 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 and, and opened up, mm -hmm. and the only way we're going to do that is if you serve those people. And mm. he talks about that in that book, and I would encourage. No, anyone a, to read it yeah that's a great um uh that, that's a very good uh very good book and and it's a great uh mental image that eaters you know leaders eat last yeah. uh and i spent some time in the army and that was one of the things that that we always did as leaders is we ate last and it, it's amazing just those little bitty things that you you serve uh, it's amazing how it does change uh, the culture. It does change the influence of the of the you know internal and external influence um, because we you know it's it's interesting I think that we forget the uh, I guess the indirect influence that leader just because you have the title right, right? I mean you you may not you may just got pinned on leader today right but your indirect influence is huge and i think is as sometimes i think leaders forget that sometimes i think the great leaders actually accomplish more not with the authority that comes with the title that's right but with the influence that comes from exceptional leadership exactly and i certainly have experienced that uh one of my mentors ron Fryson. i remember when he would come in to help me solve problems I didn't ask him to, mm -hmm. but he knew that he could offer some help. Mm -hmm. And so he would show up and, and do it, but he would do it in a way that wasn't, hey, I'm the big boss. That's right. In fact, most people would sit down with him and have a lunch and feel so comfortable talking to him. It was like their buddy next door. Mm -hmm. But other leaders would come in and people were stiff and, you know, mm -hmm. were very proper in what they said. And mm -hmm. I think that's a mark of someone who, who gets that leadership mm -hmm. occurs mostly through service. It does. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, because we're all you're, you're, we're dealing with humans, you know, we're dealing with folks that are that are that are sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, sure. husbands, wives, uh, significant others. I mean, we're we're dealing with humans, and if you want that that someone who's always proper like a robot and doesn't that that can't open up what's going on, then it makes it very difficult to make any imp changes to to really get an idea of. How do we drive change, and how do we how do we take this this organization to uh, the next level? There's a long list of things that any leader has to get right, mm. whether it's for profit or nonprofit doesn't matter. If it's for profit, you've got to have a really good product. It's got to mm -hmm. be well developed. It's got to be tested. It's right. got to meet a real need. Yeah, you need really good marketing to understand your market, know who the customers are, know where they are. You have to have a really good offer and you have to have good pricing, and you have to be able to get your messaging out to those customers. you got to have good technology. you got to be able to build. Wow. As somebody at Bell Southwood, the leader of our Bell Southwood organization, used to say, if you can't build it, it's just a hobby. <laughs> and that's true. You have to have really good operations because you have to deliver. You have to have salespeople who can really find a customer's need and mm -hmm. really develop that prospect and sell. You need good customer service. and you need, All of those things are important. You need good finance. you got to get the right capital in the right places. Mm -hmm. But all of those hard aspects of running an organization are fueled by people. Mm, that's a good and if point. you overlook the human dimension of those, you will leave potential 
un- untapped potential on the table. And no leader wants to leave untapped potential on the table. No. So tackling that human dimension through influence instead of authority mm. can make a huge difference on how well an organization thrives. Yeah, I like the way you put that, in- influence instead of authority. Um, because that, that's, that's, a diff- that's a whole – you know, management just sounds like authority, doesn't it? It's, if, if I'm in management – It's the, like science, and it's spreadsheets, and it's right. telling somebody, you know, use a clipboard, go do this, go do that. And those things have to happen oh, in an organization. Right. But how you do those that's things right. – yeah. Makes all the difference in the world. All the, yeah, it's funny. We've got we just got a puppy for Christmas, and um, so in the morning. So you have a new boss. So I have a new and boss. It barks every and it morning. Barks every morning. Tells but you when it, to go outside. It, but and, uh, in the morning, it, you know, it's funny about influences. Is in the morning he likes to eat before he goes outside. But I know that if he doesn't go outside first, I'm going to have to clean something mm. up. So. The way I in so I in the beginning I was kind of like just he was small enough that I could pick him up and take right. him outside. Well now he's he's a, he's a little bigger, so I can't just grab him because he's quicker than I am. So the influence is is I, is I praise him and I give him a little treat, and now he just he just co- goes right outside. There's no there's no argument, right. right? But but you know it's so funny that you know just thinking about the 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 puppy and and management it's it's so much easier with that positive influence than um you know yelling or screaming or or uh uh, having the clipboard and in managing so talk to me a little bit about what are you seeing i mean you, you you mentioned your um your career with Bell South, now AT and T. Um, what are you seeing that's changed in the last fifteen years as it relates to uh, leadership and culture? And I mean, what are what are some things that that you're seeing that maybe wasn't present thirty years ago at Bell South? Well, change is constant, but the rate of change is speeding up, mm. and the pervasiveness of change in our lives is change is getting deeper and deeper. And I just think back uh, at, at, at AT&T. We, we, our history was we were a phone company. Right. That's all we were. And that was a big thing. It mm-hmm. was a huge thing. It was mm-hmm. an important thing. But what used to be a wireline phone connected to the wall became a wireless phone. Mm-hmm. But that wireless phone became something more when uh, other uh, technology started got, it was mixed mm-hmm. with it. And we, we have smartphones. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really took off with with Steve Jobs. He wasn't the first, but 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 when the Apple iPhone came out, mm-hmm. it put in the hands a computer. And if you think about the kind of change that occurred with that, now that is not a phone. In fact, people don't use the phone so much for talking on the phone. They're texting. They're doing banking. They're you know, using it to connect to Amazon or other online ordering. They're doing a, a wide variety of things. The, the GPS has been replaced. But think about the kinds of things changed with one device. Mm. And think about all the different generations that are now using it. My parents use it. I use it. Younger generations. And what each generation does with it has a lot to do with how comfortable they are with technology. Mm -hmm. But think about the impacts to us at AT AT&T. At the time we rolled that out, I was in a customer service organization. So we had 20,000 reps in call centers across the United States Mm -hmm. receiving phone calls. These people have been trained for years. AT&T has employees with long histories because it's a great company to work for. People don't leave so we had and so you invest a lot in training so they're trained to support a a phone and now we have people calling in saying hey i can't connect to my bank and we had to go change training Mm -hmm. because now we have nothing to do with the bank and there are a lot of points of failure between that phone and the bank Mm -hmm. many of which we have no control over no knowledge of really Mm -hmm. But that's what customers are calling. So think about how the change that had on leadership there. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing happened in all industries. Mm -hmm. Think about how Uber is changing the transportation industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, Amazon is making huge changes in delivery business. Mm -hmm. And not just online shopping. They're changing the cloud where people get their data. I mean, it's just change is constant. It's fast. And if as a leader, if you're not keeping up with all of that, Mm you will become irrelevant very, very fast. Right. And as a leader, unless you're a one-man show, 
you need all of your employees keeping up on all that because you are not the one who makes or break, breaks your reputation. Your frontline employees, the one who talk to customers all day, every day, they are the ones mm -hmm. that are creating or destroying your reputation. Right. And so that's the place to really invest, I think, to make sure that we're keeping up with changes. And I think that's a, a mindset change. You asked me what's changing in leadership. Mm -hmm. To me, the biggest change in leadership is that change is so much faster and so much deeper than it used to be, mm -hmm. it's hard to keep up. And if you're not out there a step or two ahead, the change will occur, you'll become irrelevant before you even realize it's happened. Mm. No, and, and I guess there's that, that willingness too, right, to, uh, to make mistakes. Yeah. So you, you can do it somewhat at the speed of change. Right. Because if you wait till it's proven, right, if you say, well, we're not, we're, we're not a, you know, just for instance, we're, we're not a, uh, a company that believes in um, uh, folks working from home. Mm -hmm. So we're only going to hire folks to come down to downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to be at this office from 8 to 5, and we're not going to do telecommute or anything like that. Well, imagine if, if that was your mindset, mm -hmm. you probably would lose half of the, the viable candidates right. in many cases. Um, so, but then, you, but, but, so, you know, I guess that's the other question is how do you gauge the, the it's changing so rapidly, how, how do leaders figure out which avenue to, you know, to change with? Well, I think leaders need to get out of their offices mm, that's uh, because point. I think the uh, being in a room and leaders need to spend time thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to spend time alone thinking and planning and they need to spend time with a small group of people and, you know, outside analysts and things like that. All that's mm -hmm. important. But I think the most valuable thing is for a leader to get out, talk to their customers, talk to their frontline employees. The best intelligence any company has will always come from their customers and their frontline employees. Mm. Now, there are other great sources of data, but there will never be a richer source of data than mm. those two sources. And if you do that, you're going to find your customers' needs are changing. You won't understand it at first because the customers are gonna, the customers don't always even understand what they're trying to say. Mm. You know, sometimes they need help trying to figure out what their how their needs are are, are changing or or emerging. Yeah. But at least you become aware of it soon. You can start hunting for answers and how do I solve for that? Yeah, I like that. I mean, I think it was said that Henry Ford said when he asked his customers what they wanted, uh, they wanted a faster horse. Um, but he was listening. It was the construct they had. Right. They knew what they wanted. Right. They, they just they didn't know how to put it right. into uh, context. And the genius of a leader would be hearing that. That's right. And then helping that customer understand their needs better by creating a product that gets them there. That's it. Yeah. No, I think I think that's so important is is leaders getting out there. I love that show. Is it Undercover Boss? Right. That's it's such a great right. it's such a great show cuz but you shouldn't have to go undercover, mm -hmm. you know, back to your point. Yeah. If you're if you're a servant leader um, and you're using the right influence. Right. I mean, you would you, you can just talk to your employees. I think one thing that happens is leaders read a book, they go to a conference, they hear an amazing speaker. Mm. And they're energized by it, and they recognize, okay, I need to go do something. And they think that the thing they need to go do is like a project mm. with, you know, with a list of actions and put dates beside it. And they don't realize that what they really need to do is start changing the culture. And that's not, you can't change a culture with a project, but you need to create an environment. And the reason why I say that is because when I would go out and talk to my frontline employees, at first, they, they really didn't want to tell me much. They would talk, mm -hmm. and they had a long list of complaints, of things that needed to go fi be fixed, but they didn't trust me enough to tell me the really good stuff. Right. So just having a conversation is not enough. You have to build the, the, the environment, if you mm -hmm. will, or the ecosystem so that yeah. they feel comfortable speaking the truth to you because sometimes they might need to tell you something that the layers of management in between you and them has filtered out. Mm. That's so true. Bureaucracy is necessary for structure, but it also, as in fact, that same book, Simon Sinek, he talks about how the larger your organization gets, the farther uh, leaders get from their customers and their employees. Mm -hmm. And those customers' employees become abstractions. They become numbers or, or names on a spreadsheet, and they lose the personal connection. And that really has a negative impact on the decisions that start coming out of it. So I, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is, if you really want to get that kind of information from your customers and mm -hmm. from your, your employees, you're going to have to create the culture that, that makes it okay for them to do it. And that might take some time. That's not a project plan. Right. 
Yeah, that's, that's a change. You, if you want to change culture, change yourself first. That's right. Yeah, that was, um, I think, uh, uh, Gandhi said, uh, be the change yeah. in yourself that you want to see in the world. Right. Um, and, I, and I think that's so true. Like, if you want to be, if you want your clients and frontline employees to be more open, you need to be more open, right? That's good. Uh, exactly. If you want them to share more, then, then you need to share right. more. Uh, yeah, it's so true. The, the, you know, the, 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 the more layers you get, the further and further from the truth, oftentimes. There's a, another book I want to mention here. It's a book I just finished reading for the third time. And I think when you and I talked a few weeks ago, I mentioned it. Kim Scott, who worked at Google and Apple, I believe, mm-hmm. wrote a, a book maybe two years ago called Radical Candor, C-A-N-D-O-R. Mm-hmm. It is amazing. I have read books before about how do you have difficult conversations, and they're all, they're all amazing. But this book, I think, very well explains that if you want to influence a change in behavior or a change in action or attitude with someone, you will never be able to do that until you can speak the truth to them. Mm. Pretending, false praise, none of that is going to really, really accomplish that if they don't see the truth. And it gets back to this story that I was sharing earlier with that employee. Mm-hmm. She was sharing, if I had not held the mirror up in front of her, mm-hmm and kept doing that until she could see herself as others did, she couldn't correct the problem. But Kim Scott makes the point, if you want to speak the truth to someone, they won't be able to receive that truth Mm. unless they know it's coming from a genuine place, unless you really care for them. Uh, Kind of a truth and love approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, and she talked in her book about how you create the culture Mm -hmm. that you can show that you care, but you can't fake that. It's not, that's not a fake it till you make it thing. You, no. If it's not real, yeah. they'll know. Oh, yeah. You, and that's even worse. So, yeah, that's so true. There's but, not, but I think it's a great book. It talks about how to how to hire and use these her concepts. But I recommend everyone uh, no, I think that's, try that out. That's great. Uh, great insight because you're right. You, it, authenticity, you can't fake. I mean, there's there's one thing that, in, that, that gives us hope as humans because that means computers – are going to really, really struggle (laughs) to replace us because that's the one thing that we, we have is, is, uh, we can truly, uh, sense when someone's being genuine. They, you know, they talk about how kids know that's right. If you're genuine or not, but the truth is adults know too. They do. I think as we mature, we, it's not as obvious to us, but, but we know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know when there's a, uh, when we suppress so much of it, Kids have it because they haven't suppressed the, the, the those feelings. But as we, you know, as we get right. a little calloused, we, we start suppressing. Right. But we know. We just, you know, we know. I don't know why that person doesn't seem right. whatever, or that person doesn't seem genuine. We may not be able to put our finger on it, mm-hmm. but there's a reason. And and I think uh, that's something certainly that management could struggle with if they're not uh, if if they're not paying attention. So, Kevin, how um, – what makes a good um, client for you? What makes a good opportunity for you to, to come out and, and kind of part your wisdom mm-hmm. on organizations? I think um, s- small to mid-sized business yeah. who is at a point where they, they feel stuck. Mm-hmm. They feel like they have a great product and service. But, but their growth has, has slowed down. Mm-hmm. And th- they feel like their their employee base is not, uh, they're not able to get from them what they need, mm-hmm. what they know is capable. It's a perfect client. Uh, I have twice working for a big corporation when we want to launch a new product, we create an internal startup. Okay. Uh, and it, you know, it very much looks like sometimes it's a separate department. Maybe it's even a subsidiary. And I've twice been able to be part of these where we would take a product, we would test it in the market to prove that it was financially viable. Mm. And if it is, we would scale it up. A- AT&T doesn't make money selling a hundred of anything. We need to sell millions of things. Mm. And so a successful small business needs to be scaled there. And what I've seen over and over again is what worked when you're small doesn't always work when you put technology, technology behind it and you speed it up and handle it at high volume. Mm. In fact, speed and volume will usually break almost any process. Right. And it's not just breaking your technology, your systems. It could be your, your processes and policies, but it could be your people as well. Mm-hmm. You have to change 
your thinking, your leadership thinking, if you want to change your results when you're growing. And, and so to me, a, a, a small to medium-sized business that's growing mm -hmm. but has hit a wall, yeah. that's a perfect client for me. Yeah, yeah. no, that sounds good. And then so, so typically you would come in and um, how does the process work with you? You come in and do an assessment. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you work with leadership? I mean, how, how does that work? Um, it, it depends on what, what they think their problem is. But the first thing is going to be a, a conversation with the leader and the leaders, mm -hmm. uh, just to get some sense. I had a conversation just yesterday with a leader. He has a, um, a business, and, and he's trying to grow it, and he feels like that he is stuck. Mm. And uh, we were talk, me, him, and his direct reports, there were five or six of us there, and we're trying to figure out what do they think it is, and they all have a very different opinion about what they think the customers believe. Isn't that funny? And he said, and he said, well, this is odd. I thought we all shared the same view. We <laughs> meet it, every mean, week for a staff meeting. How did we, yeah. and, and I think a lot of times, you know, you, leaders are working on problems that aren't really the problem. That's right. They're the symptom of the problem. Mm -hmm. So the first stage for me is to have a conversation to figure out where they are, but then I think you have to do an assessment. You know, if you're if you have a customer experience issue, maybe you need a secret shopper to come in and figure mm. out what's going on, or maybe you go talk to the frontline employees. And in fact, what I encourage him to do, and this is not something, and he has not hired me. I, I'm hoping that he does, of <laughs> course. But um, but I suggest that he, before he even considers hiring me, go talk to your 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 customers directly. Skip all the layers of of management mm -hmm. in between, and go mm -hmm. talk to your frontline employees. Mm. And then you'll have a good idea of where your problems are because mm. they know. They know. The question is, why aren't they telling you? Mm. Well, you have to earn that kind of information from yeah. an employee or from a customer because people don't like conflict. No, no, and, we don't. And especially telling a boss's boss's boss, yeah, yeah you're, you're going to be the last person that hears from them mm -hmm. what the truth is about your business. So, But yes, an assessment is, is early stage. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of fixing it, I'm always going to take the approach, uh, the, the lens through which I look at any business mm -hmm. or any organization, even a nonprofit, is the people dimension. Right. Yes, there are absolutely some hard things. How is the product? What's the customer's experience? Critically important. But how are you handling the leadership dimension, mm. the people dimension? Because I believe that is how you unlock the potential of any organization. No, I agree with you. I agree 100%. And, and that's our philosophy as well. Um, and briefly, you do keynote speaking. Speak. Uh, so what, what are a couple, what are some topics that you might might cover? Well, there? I, I am absolutely passionate about this build them up because I believe that every leader has the ability to tap into potential of their employees mm -hmm. at all levels if they will focus on building up somebody. Mm. And and this whole notion of confidence, some people have too much confidence. We call that hubris. That's destructive. Right. Um, and our earlier conversation was kind of on the notion of some people have too little of it. They have self doubt and they're they're bound mm -hmm. by it. You know, it, most things in life, I think, I have found, and uh, I'm curious to see if you agree, mm. there's a continuum where too much of something or too little of something is kind of destructive and a bad thing. It's moderation. Mm -hmm. So this is a case where I think you, you want humble confidence, right? That's right. But if you can start helping build up your employees to get to that confidence and help them get on a path where they're growing, mm -hmm. whatever that means for them, and for everybody it's something different, then I think you have unlocked your the potential of your organization. And so I, I have a workshop that I do. Uh, called you don't have to tear them down mm -hmm. to build them up and i do a keynote related to that as well and it's really aimed at looking at what does any what do any of us need mm -hmm. to be successful we need to believe in ourselves mm -hmm. we need to be on a path to grow mm -hmm. and we need the 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 ecosystem around us the people who are part of our network our circle to be encouraging us mm. that's what we need so if you are a leader and you have 100 employees, you have 100 people who need those three things. What can you do? You can't be confident for them. Mm -hmm. You can't grow for them. What can you do to help them? And that's the mission that I'm on is to yeah. help leaders, whether it be a CEO or a team leader or a pastor or an executive director of a nonprofit or a coach for a little league. Mm -hmm. I want to help all of them use their influence as a leader to build up all those people. I love it. I, th I mean, I, I, I love the message, Kevin. I think that exactly what you're doing is what we need right now uh, in all facets, either to, um, uh, to certainly help all organizations from, from profit to nonprofit to community uh, and everything in between. So uh, the best place for folks to find you um, is your website, the KD group.com uh, let's make it easy just kevinphillips.com okay 
Kevin Phillips. It will take you to the same place. Perfect. KevinPhillips.com. That's right. And there's a tab there for Build Them Up if you want to know more about that. Or you can go to www.buildthemup.info. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for being on the show. I think your mission and your message is exactly what we need right now, and I'm very appreciative. Thank you for the gift of this opportunity. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care.